Section 22 of Birds and Nature, Volume 11, Number 2, February 1902. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tila Tomchik, Altoona, Pennsylvania. The Birds in Their Winter Home, too, in the Fields. A half day's tramp through the pastures and fields of a Mississippi second bottom, any sunshiny day, from the first of December till the first of March, will reveal some of the reasons why this is a veritable bird's paradise in winter. Fields once in cultivation but now abandoned to sedge and Bermuda grass, cultivated fields, where giant cockle burrs wrestle with morning glory vines for the possession of the soil, tracts of palm-like palmetto and marshy jungles of willows, pompous grass and briars afford attractive feeding grounds by day and safe roosting places by night to myriads of winter visitants. In such places are found abundant supplies of the insects, berries, and seeds, which this humid, semi-tropical climate produces in great profusion. Good shelter and plenty to eat settle the problem of living for the present for our little feathered friends. Walk out on these broad savannas about the 1st of February before a tint of white or pale green has appeared on the Chickasaw plum, Prunus chickasa, and take note of the abundance and vigor of bird life before spring has begun to make serious inroads upon it. In the drier parts of these lowlands, especially where stubby plum bushes and haws abound, our old friend the field sparrow meets us with the same innocent, confiding air that we remember as characteristic of him in the region of Lake Erie and Lake Michigan. He is one of the birds that we can talk about in the indicative mood without ifs or apologies. The good that he does in disposing of surplus insect life is not offset by tolls levied on our ripest and juiciest fruit. He never goes over to the enemy to plunder those who trust him. Even the robin, whose praises are in everybody's mouth, becomes a pirate when our cherries and mulberries ripen, and we wish he would stay away from our premises till the berry season is over. The pale red or horn-colored beak of this bird will help us to distinguish him from another, often mistaken for him, the chippy, or chipping sparrow, a bird of the same general appearance and size. Even with the naked eye, you can detect differences enough to distinguish the two species. Both are small birds with chestnut or rufous crown caps. The chippy has a patch of black on his forehead and bill of the same color. His brother of the fields wears no black, and his bill, as before stated, is a pale red or horn color. In central Mississippi, as in parts of northern Ohio, field sparrows are very numerous but chippies quite rare. In the grass or crouched down close to the brown earth and gray weed stems, we see another of our friends. With a chip, he jumps up out of the grass and is away before you can see what particular shade of gray or brown is most conspicuous. However, he doesn't fly far but suddenly drops into some inviting tuft, spreading out his tail like a fan as he does so, as if on purpose to show you its margin of white. This is the only one of our common sparrows 
that shows the white feather, the vesper sparrow, or bay-winged bunting. The field sparrow, as one authority says, had better be called the tree sparrow, because of his marked fondness for bushes and shrubs. But both of the former's names fit. He is rightly called the Vesper Sparrow from his delightful custom of singing his choicest hymns to the dying sun, and Bay-winged Bunting from the conspicuous patch of Bay or Rufus on the lesser wing coverts. Sometimes in company with the Vespers, we see the slate-colored junco or snowbird. At other times, a gorgeous, distinguished-looking sparrow, named from his partiality to these broad, low fields, the savannah sparrow. He is the dandy of this winter resort. His plaid coat and striped shirt eclipse the somber colors of all his cousins. The epaulets of gold on his shoulders indicate his high rank but for all that he is no dude, for he works as hard as anybody to find his own breakfast and enjoys it all the more that he eats his crickets in the sweat of his brow. A simple chip is the only remark he makes to us or to his companions as he runs along the cotton rows in quest of food. Ornithologists, however, tell us that up in Canada, in his summer home, he sings a weak, grasshopper-like song in marked contrast to the musical efforts of his neutral-tinted cousin, the Vesper. The fields of broom sedge are the favorite haunts of one of the birds whose cheerful music and winning ways help to make June in the north the high tide of the year, when all of life that has ebbed away comes rippling back into each inlet and creek and bay. I never see the meadow lark or hear his cheery whistle that I do not smell the blossoming clover and hear the ringing spink, spank, spink of the bobolink or catch the subtle suggestion of strawberries that comes floating to my nostrils on the warm June breeze. In a thirty-minute walk through the sedge, I have flushed as many as two or three hundred of these birds. They are called field larks by the negroes, who regard them as legitimate game. The lark's whistle, it can hardly be called a song, contains a bit of good advice habitually disregarded by the negroes. They interpret it as, laziness will kill you. The colored people have an ornithology all their own, in which their own observations are strangely mingled with superstition. They tell us of two kinds of mockingbirds, de real and de French varieties. The real mockingbird deserves an article all to himself. His winning ways, playful disposition, and ability as a singer give him a place second to none among our American birds. I am pleased to see the spirit of Americanism growing in our literature, that conventional allusions to the skylark and the nightingale, birds few of us have ever seen or heard, are becoming rarer and rarer, while those to the robin, the mockingbird, and the wood thrush are becoming more frequent. The mockingbird, like other singers, does his best during the courting and nesting seasons, but does not confine his concerts to that joyous time. On warm days in winter, he loves to perch in the cedars and give his listeners a sample of what he can do. An earnest of the floods of melody that spring will bring. Balmy air, green of cedar and water oak, and bird music disarrange our mental almanac. Even the nodding Narcissus contributes to the illusion that it is not February, but May. The French mockingbird is no mockingbird at all, but the logger-headed shrike or butcherbird. 
like some people he tries to occupy a front seat even if his music wins for him one of the lowest seats of the choir a bean pole in the garden the topmost wire of the fence and the top of a solitary shrub or tree are alike acceptable to him for it's all one to him if he gets to see all that is going on in his little world no doubt he does do mischief during the nesting season when eggs or tender nestlings are easier to find or more acceptable to his fastidious palate than the mice and insects which compose his winter diet just now he is a most pleasing bit of decided color black white and blue-gray very refreshing to the eye amid the browns and grays of last year's vegetation when a cold wave comes what a scurrying takes place each winter visitor packs his grip and strikes for the nearest shelter be it canebrake or swampy jungle where tall grass and cattails above briar and water below make a retreat impregnable to assault from the enemy flying through the air or creeping along the ground if the cold wave continues until the ground freezes the birds suffer at such time half-starved robins gorge themselves on the berries of the china tree melia asderac and have a general drunk they never eat many of the berries unless they are the only provisions obtainable unless driven to it by stress of the weather an excuse for drunks that cannot always be truthfully given by the lords of creation while the silly birds are sitting around trying to throw off the effects of their debauch an enemy comes upon the scene the negroes take advantage of the robin's disability to manage his own affairs and feast high on roast robin fried robin stewed robin etc much to the detriment of next spring's music in northern fields and orchards the warm breath of the gulf steals in upon our little world and a change comes the birds remember that they are due in a few days in an ohio orchard or on an illinois prairie so they pack and go the allurements of a southern spring with all its fragrance and charm do not hold them without a good-bye they are gone not to return till once more frosts and shortening days portend the aged year is near his end james stephen compton end of section twenty two Recording by Tila Tomchik, Altoona, Pennsylvania. Section 23 of Birds and Nature, Volume 11, Number 2, February 1902. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in May 2018. Section 23. Music Loving Felines. According to observation, music has power not only to soothe the savage or the troubled breast of civilized man, but its potency extends to the brute world as well. Among those animals which appear to be charmed by musical sounds, it would seem difficult to find any manifesting a keener delight than the ordinary domestic cat. The London spectator some months ago referred to an instance where a cat showed marked pleasure in a whistled tune. This recalled to memory the circumstance of a certain cat, a beautiful creature with black and ecru stripes, whose appreciation of the musician's art awakened in him inordinate emotion. Were he within hearing distance of the piano, the eliciting of a few chords was sufficient to beguile him into the parlour. 
when permitted to walk across the quays he always appeared pleased with his performance but he was discriminating and exhibited decided preferment for vocal renditions over instrumental the miserere from il trovatore affected him more deeply than anything else and might appear to confirm the theory held by some that the position of a soul is not limited to the human creation settling himself in front of the singer he would listen with bated breath and eyes widely dilated never would he move a muscle unless after a prolonged interval in the music when he would softly approach the vocalist to caress her face and neck with his paw or to smooth her cheek with his own his coaxings always had to sort for effect when he would once more seat himself with becoming decorum to imbibe the harmony which seemed to ravish his being this is by no means an isolated instance of fondness for musical discourse on the part of cats though this particular case affords an extravagant illustration of that aesthetic sensitiveness which characterizes probably the whole feline tribe s virginia lewis End of section 23。section 24 of birds and nature。volume 11。number 2。february 1902。recorded for librivox.org。by tila tomchik。fireflies。the day disrobing for her rest。delayed to lift the twilight bars and o'er them from the golden west wandered this troop of truant stars end of section twenty four this recording is in the public domain Section 25 of Birds and Nature, Volume 11, Number 2, February 1902. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Sugarcane. Saccharum officinarium, Lynn. Has God then given its sweetness to the cane? unless his laws be trampled on in vain cowper charity 190 this highly important plant belongs to the grass family it is perennial with thick succulent jointed rhizomes having root tufts at the joints the stems are numerous erect cylindrical growing to a height of six to twelve feet like the rhizome the stem is jointed the internodes being however much shorter toward the base the leaves are numerous toward the apex being deciduous toward the base the apical tuft-like inflorescence is quite characteristic the individual flowers are small and unattractive in appearance one of the remarkable things about the plant is that the fruit never matures it must be remembered that the plant referred to is entirely distinct from the so-called sugarcane of the central states from which sorghum molasses is made it is very doubtful whether sugarcane occurs anywhere in the wild state at present authorities are quite unanimous in expressing it as their opinion that its original home was india it is a plant that has been under cultivation for many centuries alexander the great in his invasions of india found that the inhabitants of that country cultivated and used it extensively as a food article theophrastus mentions a sweet salt sugar which he obtained by evaporating the juice of an indian reed-like plant which was perhaps sugar-cane though there is no conclusive evidence that the earlier greeks and romans were familiar with sugar they employed honey quite universally the sweet cane of scripture is probably andropogon calamus aromaticus or sweet calamus which was a native of india it is presumed by some that the cane grown in china was originally native there the cultivation of sugar cane seems to have spread very rapidly it early found its way to persia and arabia 
and then from arabia as a centre has spread to the mediterranean districts sicily cyprus spain and italy it found its way into santo domingo as early as fourteen ninety four and to brazil early in the sixteenth century at the present time cane is grown in nearly all tropical and subtropical countries the southern united states producing more than any other country there are many varieties recognized by cultivators differing in color texture and other minor characteristics since cane does not ripen fruit it is propagated by transplanting the rhizomes and top portions of the stem and after a field is once planted new crops are permitted to spring up from the old rhizomes and this accounts for the awful tangle of the famous southern cane brakes which figured so extensively in the slave days when these fields served as hiding places for the fugitive slaves the ripe cane is cut close to the ground the leaves stripped off and the tassels cut off it is then carted to the cane mill and passed between large rollers which express the juice which is then clarified by means of lime animal charcoal and blood heat further aids the purifying process by coagulating the albuminous matter which mixed with other impurities rises to the surface as a scum and is removed by means of a special ladle the lime combines with the free acid present and settles to the bottom the juice is boiled until it acquires a proper tenacity when it is passed into a cooler and allowed to crystallize the sugar is then placed in large perforated casks and allowed to drain for two or three weeks when it is packed into hogsheads and exported under the name of raw sugar or muscovado sugar the drainings form molasses raw sugar is taken to the sugar refinery and purified by heating with water and bullock's blood filtered through canvas bags and finally allowed to percolate very slowly through large cylinders containing freshly prepared coarse-grained animal charcoal the filtered liquor is then boiled by the aid of steam when sufficiently tenacious it is poured into conical molds and when solidified the stoppers are removed to allow the treacle to drain off the loaves from the molds are then sugared as it is called by pouring over them a saturated sugar solution which by slowly percolating through them carries with it coloring matter and other impurities without dissolving the sugar crystals when a saturated aqueous solution of sugar is allowed to cool slowly it forms large beautiful crystals known as sugar or rock candy caramel is burnt sugar it has a peculiar odor and loses its sweet taste becoming bitter it is used largely as a coloring agent for coloring liquids sugar has innumerable uses as an article of food it is not surpassed though it cannot support life alone because it contains no nitrogen it is the important ingredient in candies pastries sweetened drinks etc molasses and treacle are much used and must not be confounded with the sorghum molasses made from the sugar cane of the central states molasses and treacle sometimes have a peculiar and to many a very objectionable flavor due to impurities present molasses as well as treacle when fermented gives rise to rum the popular notion that sugar is injurious to teeth is without foundation it has no action on teeth whatever if anything it has antiseptic properties and preserves the teeth it is however undoubtedly true that the excessive consumption of sweets pastries in particular is bad for the digestion as externally manifested by a dirty complexion and skin eruptions as a whole sugar by itself is not injurious it is an excellent food a heat producer and easily assimilated americans especially the american youth are the great sugar consumers of the world in medicine sugar is employed to disguise the taste of disagreeable remedies and to coat pills it has no direct curative properties in disease albert schneider in the section twenty five Section twenty six of Birds and Nature, Volume eleven, number two, February nineteen o two. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Nemo. Death of the Forest Monarch. Hark, heard you that wailing cry, sad and low, a nation mourning for their chief? Stricken and dead he lies, and blow by blow, 
is being stripped of limb and leaf now from his course is taken the wreath his just reward for battling many a year against elements mourn him your grief ye trees becomes the time the world should hear your requiem and for him drop a tear each year the wild bird build its nest high in his crown and would its young uprear century supreme the forest monarch ruled but the earth's broad breast that nourished him the axe brought his return the forest monarch is at rest all nature save the human seems to mourn george w h phillips jr end of section twenty six this recording is in the public domain End of Birds and Nature, Volume 11, Number 2, February 1902.